Thank you, Dan and Liz. Put up that picture of Connolly first. I know several people on Facebook have probably seen it, but kind of throw your eyes on him. One of these days I'll be able to wear my pajamas all the time. My goal in life. But he, uh, you know, he never is a big, bright face smiler, but that, that's him. He's looking like himself there and doing, doing better. So he says that they're uh, walking him a little bit, making him exercise. He's got some good, nutritious food. Of course, uh, may have been eating well all along, but, uh, you know, you get in a situation like this, they, they take extra special care to make sure that you're kind of uh, getting, getting exactly what you need. Uh, Edna Whitman sent me a text today and said that she's a, headed home. She was headed home when she sent it, as soon as she's there. So thank the Lord for that. And she, you know, usually when they send you home, you're not completely well. You've got to get some, some more med medicine to take and, and some more improvements. So continue to pray for Edna with that uh, heart fluid problem. Uh, Libby texted me this morning and said that she was at home. This is a public service announcement. Put that uh, snowmageddon picture up there. This, this is a... Uh, uh, if you live in these particular parts, it, this tells you how many loaves of bread you'll need to buy in order to get ready for that. So we're kind of in the area where you'll need at least, I would say go ahead and buy two loaves of bread and you'll probably be, you probably survive, all right? How much milk? Well, you know, there's, a, there's another chart that I meant to bring. It's kind of a milk and bread uh, uh, ratio chart. But uh, usually a gallon of milk will get you through almost any snowstorm. Unless you don't make snow cream. Unless you make snow cream. You make snow cream and you're like, you know, anything could happen. Snow Mageddon, 2019 alert. Now, I, I don't know if all of y'all have met Doug Swain or not. He's the deacon at the Willie Spring Baptist Church. And he's the one with Bertha's Barbecue Ministry. And he's the one for the last couple of years. Uh, we've been, for various reasons and charities, been purchasing our boss and butts from yeah, he is really going, he's about, he, he has more grills than ever before, and he helps a lot of people. He always, uh, of course, it's very good uh, meat that he barbecues. I think he did about 600 ribeye steaks for a uh, fundraiser for an organization a couple of weeks ago. It took him about two hours to do it, but uh, he's, he's really a, a great guy. He and his wife, Jillian, we know him, and his daughter, Amber, known him for many years. If you're not hooked up with him on Facebook, go over and friend him, because he's just hilarious. He keeps something going all the time. And this is where I got that, you know, that right, non -non nonsense right there. But things like that, if you, if you don't mess with the computer, some people say, well, I don't, I'll never get on the computer. I say, well, that's all right. Ain't nothing wrong with that. If you stay away from it, fine. But I, I enjoy it. Things like that kind of give me a smile. I uh, can't tell you, uh, this is something I don't have any interest in at all. But uh, many years ago, uh, well, I don't think... About half that many years ago, Terry and I served at the Willie Springs Baptist Church in uh, near Ardmore. And the adults there that were a little bit younger than us, we were just a little bit older, but uh, the adults who became the foundation for a really tremendous church growth effort there uh, came from a really, really strong youth group. And uh, a man named Billy Michael and his wife, Dortha, were the youth directors, and they, they were not salaried people or professionally trained, but they just loved the kids. Their kids had two daughters and a son who was in, in the youth department, and uh, I don't think Billy could sing or play an instrument, but he, he got to put the kids together as a choir. Now, when, we, when I was there as a pastor, all, a lot of those kids that were in the choir and in the youth group were deacons, teachers, VBS workers, and just... just it's a tremendous testimony to, and that's kind of the story of the youth program that Terry and Danny and I came out of from the Flint Baptist Church. Uh, just uh, how many preachers and pastors and singers and, uh, and servants of God, teachers, that came out of our youth group, people that are still serving the Lord, still serving the Lord. I, I keep, up, keep track with the Berries, uh, Connie Beeson, uh, Tim Hutchison, uh, just so many of the young people. And so, uh, you know, they, they're, no, I don't think any of them, uh, my, I think Connie's still at Flint, but, I, you know, a lot of times we say these, these young people like to look at Addison and Avery and the boys who were here this morning and so they're, say, they're the future of our church. Well, you know, they're really not. <laughs> they're not going to be, they probably won't come here. They'll, they'll go somewhere else. That's, when, when we have young people, 
uh, uh, Carter and uh, Bailey are still here, but uh, you know, how, how much longer are we going to be able to keep them? Alan and Chandler pray that they'll go away just every day and uh, <laughs> move out of the house. Carter kind of really did well with Carter. They got him out of the house, but they, they still hadn't paid the rent somewhere else. But you know, sometimes you have to take little baby steps like that before you can just get them out and change all the locks on the doors. We found out who knocked on our door last night. I'm glad we didn't shoot. He's the Amazon delivery guy. <laughs> Terry got out of the car today and said, is there a box on the front door? I said, a box on the front door on Sunday? He said, yeah. So this guy was out like, what, 9, 10 o'clock last night, delivered in the dark, and evidently just threw that box down, a box of uh, stuff or, that I had ordered, and went boom, boom, and then, then ran off. And uh, so... I'm glad I didn't shoot it, but if I shoot it, <laughs> uh, what? It might have been a drone. Yeah, we'll just be coming here and drop it. I don't know how they knock on this thing, but anyway, my goodness. Uh, so I'm glad, but uh, he, I wonder if he heard all that, all that commotion going on in the house. Where's Ready Boy? If there had been a, like a, uh, a gang out there, that they, they didn't have a chance we had to drop on But anyway. Will that increase in size one more time, Andy? I don't know how much you played with it. You may have already played with it. It may not fit on the screen. It scoops over, don't it? All right. Now, I'm not calling under into question your uh, uh, what you've already tried to do. I, this is uh, Romans 3 from the Living Bible, and I thought I had a PDF version of it. Or and Andy and I thought that both of us thought that it might possibly be uh, on the Power Bible that we already use, but it, it's a pretty old program. I still like it. It's one of those things that I just, I just don't want to move on to something else. It's just so simple. It does everything that I buy it, everything I want to do. So it doesn't have a living Bible. I've heard a lot of people bad mouth. I mean, I've told you this before. I've mentioned this. A lot of people bad mouth the living Bible uh, over the years. And it's really just a paraphrase. It's not a translation. And people who spit out the word paraphrase, like, and actually if you look at the cover of the living Bible, it says the living Bible. And underneath that, it says the word paraphrase. So it doesn't claim to be a translation uh, uh, from the original languages, but Kenneth Taylor did all of his work. He was a scholar who was very well educated in the biblical languages of Hebrew and Greek. So uh, that, he did use that, but he, he, did, he did not then. What he was doing was really he was just, uh, Randy was telling me on the way home today that when his uh, mother would tell them bedtime stories, it was always a Bible story. And, and what she did, she didn't just read to them, she would tell them the story as if they were, you know, just like they were people she knew. It meant a lot to him. He still remembers it. So what Ken Taylor wanted to do is he wanted to have the Word of God, the Bible, that he could read to his children and they would understand it. It would be plain enough. So he didn't want to change anything. He didn't want to, he wasn't in, intent to make anything different. He just wanted to put it in a childlike language. So there, there are some, you know, I've never picked up a translation of the Word of God where I didn't look at it and say, you know, I would have, I would have translated that differently. I, or, I, or maybe there's a better translation. That's why I use lots of translations because I look at these guys and say, you know that, I really like. Because if you've ever studied a language, you know, you can't just take a, 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 a verse in the Bible and just say, well, this word means this, and this word means that. Because you wouldn't be able to understand it at all, because adjectives and nouns and verbs are all in different places. And it'd be like, cow, hat, dog, moon, star jumped. Uh, uh, and you know, you, you think, well, man, what world? It means perfect, makes perfect sense to them. There are, there's no such thing as a direct word-for-word -word translation. Uh, languages don't work like that. And you'll find that there are a lot of times so if you're going from English to Spanish, there's a lot of things that we talk about in English that in Spanish they don't even have a word for it. You know what the Spanish word for dentist is? In the Spanish word for dentist? It's, it's the word dentist. It's your name. It's dentist. So because they, they don't, there's not a Spanish word for it. So they, they don't have come up. So there's a lot of words where they're going along. If, if you'll listen to people who are speaking languages, They'll be going along with me, blah, 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 and say cat. And you say, well, that, that just means that they don't have a word for cat in their language and they had to throw it in. And that's the way people do. Language translation is very tricky. It's very difficult. So 
a, a paraphrase is really, really kind of what preachers and teachers do all the time. Here's what the Bible says. Now let me explain it to you, or let me interpret it, or share it with you. Let me, I believe that this says that God loves everybody in the whole world so much that he decided to send his son so that anybody who wanted to believe in him and did believe in him would have everlasting life. You see, that's John 3.16, but that's a paraphrase. It's not a translation. So there's really nothing wrong with that. However, anytime you're going from one language to another or going from reading it to explaining it, there's a possibility of getting off the track and, and uh, letting error creep in, and that happens sometimes. You have to be very careful. You have to be very careful. But there's not any one perfect translation. Uh, there, there are some that are more popular than others. I, I like them all. And, and generally speaking, when people are trying to create or write or publish a translation of the scriptures, they're trying very hard to, to get it right. They're working very hard, and I believe God's helping them. Now, if you happen to believe that there are, there are many, many people who believe the King James Version is the only version inspired by God, if you believe that, that's fine. That's all right. And I hope you, however, will be will not be offended when other people read from other translations. Or you know, that's what we're doing tonight. Because I, I, this this is a little. Paul is a very high intellect person, and sometimes he loses me when, when I when I'm reading him, what he said in old English <laughs> because he didn't speak old English. Well, this is new English, and here. In, Romans chapter 3. Let's read this whole chapter together. He's already said, he says, here's sin. And then he says, he kind of wants us to find out, are you on this list? And I'd say, uh, sin? Well, yeah, I'm on that list. Uh, there, there are several places and there are several things you mentioned that I have to say, yeah, that, there's, I'm, I'm represented in that, that list you made. And then he starts saying, well, what if you're somebody special? What if you're a Jew? Or what if you've done something special? What if you've been baptized or you've been circumcised. He says, what if you're a Roman? And you're, you're very, you got a lot of privileges and you have a lot of uh, opportunity. He says, you know, being a sinner doesn't count you out. And being a Jew or a Roman or being circumcised or being baptized or taking the Lord's Supper, those things, they don't help you. They're, they're really not, you know, they're, they're, that's not what takes the sin problem and gets rid of it. So he, he goes on. Then what's the use of being a Jew? <laughs> what's the use of being a Jew? Well, you're either a Jew or you're any. But he said, what advantage? What, do Jews have an edge on it? They're the chosen people of God. He says, well, uh, there are many special, are, are there any special benefits for them from God? He says, is there any value in the Jewish circumcision ceremony? He says, yes, being a Jew has many advantages. And he begins to tell them, first of all, God trusted them with the law so that they could uh, know and do His will. It was to Moses and to the Israelites that they, God, delivered His law. He said, well, that's, that's got to count for something. That won't get you to heaven. But he said, if you want to brag about something, say, well, man, God picked us to do that. True, some of them were unfaithful. But just because they broke the promises of God doesn't mean that God breaks His promises. Of course not. Though, though everyone else in the world is a liar, God is not. So I'm talking about liars. Let me go to my list right here. NBC, ABC, CBS, MSNBC, and CNN. So if you're making a list, all them, go ahead and throw Fox on there because they don't have any idea what they're doing either. Listen, if the only place you're getting your news and your information is from the network news on television, you're not getting the truth. I promise you. I guarantee you. Because if you'll read some newspapers and read some magazines, and if you'll listen to, uh, and there, there are so many different ways. We live in a world of information. We live in a, in a world where you can find out what the truth is. And you don't have to get it from Walter Cronkite. Do you know what one of the things, and this, this may be overblown, do you remember that uh, Lyndon Johnson, he finished John F. Kennedy's term as president. And then he was elected as president and he ran for his first term. So he could have run for another term as president. 
But then he, he surprised everybody in his party and everybody, everybody in the United States. He says, I'm not going to seek the nomination of my party for the presidency of the United States. Right. And he didn't make this a part of his speech at that time, but, but uh, those who were part of his inner circle, that's part of the LBJ library now, and everything, they said what happened was he was watching TV one day, and he turned around after something that Walter Cronkite had said about the Vietnam War and uh, on television, and he looked over, LBJ looked over at one of his counselors that was watching television with him and said, if Walter Cronkite is against us, then we've lost the world, but the war and the presidency. And today, the mainstream media is molding and shaping a narrative that is far from the truth. It is far from the truth. And all you have to do is just get a little past them, a little beyond them, to do a little research. You have to study. You, gotta, you can't just lap up everything and swallow everything you hear. You can't believe everything you hear. You've got to do a little research and you can find out what the real truth really is. So here, he says, that this is a, and you'll hear this, and of course it doesn't sound the same in the living Bible. Let God be true and every man a liar. He says, we, we should never get to a situation, we can always trust God's word. But when you're listening to people, don't trust them. Don't trust anybody. Don't trust people who are trying to convince you of something that is true. Always put them to the test. I don't believe in anybody. I, I have to find out for myself. Now, So do you remember that what the book of Psalms says about this? God, that God's word will always prove true and right no matter who questions them. I tell you one, one thing is, especially in social media, people want to fuss and argue and debate with you until, until what? Until you start quoting scripture. Right. Well, they think, well, they don't believe in God for one thing. They don't believe in scripture is the word of God. And if you start quoting the scripture to them, well, they, they know we can't argue with that fool because he's got God on his side. You know, he's, he's saying, well, the reason he believes he's right about everything is because he knows what the Bible says. A, a big thing is, let me tell you something. Fifty years ago, you could stop anybody on the street in the United States of America and argue about the Bible with them, couldn't you? Yeah. You try that these days. Even though the Bible is one of the most important <coughs> pieces of literature, barring whether you think it's the word of God or not. It's the most important book that's ever been written in human history. And the kids in school don't know anything at all about it, and people in kids in college have never even read it. So you start talking to them about the Bible, well, they, 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 want, they can't talk with you, they, they don't know how to debate anymore. Well, they don't know about Aristotle and Plato. And, uh, they don't know anything, they, well, that's just another train of thought. Let's just get all of that. Uh, but it comes back, he says, believe the word of God. Believe the scriptures. It will always prove true no matter who questions. But some say our breaking faith with God is good. Our sins serve a good purpose. For people will notice how good God is when they see how bad we are. I saw this beginning to happen back in the late 70s. That if you, if it's being advertised that someone was going to give their testimony down at the church, do you know what, if you went there, do you know what was the big draw if a celebrity or some well-known person or an athlete was going to give their testimony? They were going to talk about how awful and how terrible and what a terrible, awful criminal they had been. Yeah. And it kind of made it sound like they were really proud of all their wickedness and all their sin. Well, they're kind of saying, look at how bad I was. Doesn't that teach you about how good God is? Let me ask you something. Go ask you. Almost everybody, almost everybody. Do you know who their favorite character is in the story of the prodigal son? Who's their favorite, favorite part of their favorite character? The prodigal son. He was a knothead. He was crude. He was rude. He was hateful to his father. Do you know why he came back home? He was hungry. He 
and he ran out of money. That's all right. He's not the hero of that story. You know who ever, let me, here, this goes step up. You know who everybody despises in that story? The other son. The other son, the elder brothers. <laughs> he was a good kid. He did everything his daddy told him to do. He was always on time. He never did complain, except that one time. <laughs> so, you never had a party for me. He just took all the, but he was a good boy. Why is he not? We think of him as that old elder brother, and we say, oh, the prodigal son. Well, he needed a whooping. If, you know, if that had been my daddy, he'd say, son, welcome home. Here's a kiss. Now, here's some new shoes and a ring. Now, bend over. I'm going to beat that stuff. I'm going to, you're going to pass my old home. Shucks. We're going to get, we're going to straighten you out right now. Take him out of the woodshed, man, and, and tear him up. He's not the hero of that stuff. Really, there's only really one hero in that story, and that's the father. You know, he's, he's a good man. And he. He's a, he loves both his sons. He's the only person that has it that you look at with complete admiration. But in our, he's, what he's talking about is, is that the way we've gotten to kind of a thread is that we think we can demonstrate what a wonderful God we serve by how wicked we are. It just gives God a chance to show off. You know, even Mark Twain said this. He says, uh, God is a tremendous forgiver. He says, I am a terrible sinner. He says, we make a great pair. Well, Mark Twain said that. And uh, he knows better now. But anyway, <laughs> he says, is it fair then for him to punish us when our sins are helping him? Doesn't that sound ridiculous? But that's exactly the way people think. The more sinful we are, it may better make God look. Because he forgives us. He just says, oh, forget about it. He says, that is the way some people talk. And it really is. And that was 2,000 years ago. God forbid. What kind of God would he be to overlook sin? How could we, he ever condemn anyone? For he could not judge and condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty brought him glory. Take that up to the top of the page by pointing up his honesty to contrast my lies. If you follow through with that idea, you come to this. The worse we are, the better God likes it. The worse we are, the better God likes it. He said, that's ridiculous. But the damnation of those who say such things is judged. He says, he says that those folks are going to be damned. And he says, they're going to get what they deserve. Yet some claim that that is what I preach. You can see it through, a, like a thread through Paul's writings. Paul preached about grace. And they said, well, Paul, you're just saying then that the more we sin, grace abounds. He said, and he says, this is, what, this is what people think you've been saying about what I teach about grace. He said, this is not true. Well, then, we're, uh, are we Jews better than others? He says, no, not at all. But we've already shown that all men alike are sinners. He said, what are you paying attention in chapter 1? <coughs> Whether Jews or Gentiles, as the scriptures say, no one is good, no one in all the world is innocent. Let me interject a kind of an archaic and uh, seldom used theological phrase here that used to be very commonly spoken of and preached about, but it's falling out of our vocabulary now. Uh, in for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years until the modern era of Christianity, Bible teachers talked about the total depravity of man. The total depravity of man. And what that means is, is that every aspect, it doesn't mean that we all of us are completely 100% evil or depraved. But it means that every aspect of our being, our, our knowledge, our intellect, our heart, our emotions, uh, every aspect of our feelings and our thoughts and our processes have all been damaged by sin. Every, there's not a part of me, not a toe on my foot or a finger on my hand that hasn't been affected by sin in some way. Every part of me has been affected. That's, that's the totality of, of my depravity. 
Here's something else, too, that's, that you hear quite often. It's in songs, it's in sermons, and it's in modern philosophy. It's been in philosophy since this time. That people are basically, when you get right down to it, when you, when you just meet, and you just, just people, just folks, and you just, when you get right down to it, people are basically good. And then every once in a while you have a stray hair that's a serial killer. No, people are not basically good. We're basically bad. It takes effort to be good. You gotta do, you gotta put forth some energy. If you if you just relax, if you just kind of be yourself, they say, well, just be yourself. I used to, uh, I don't know if I use these particular shamanic words, but when guys used to come by and pick up a priest on the date, I'd look at that guy and I'd say, don't be yourself. <laughs> don't be yourself. I'd look at my daughter and say, don't be yourself either. Be somebody else, better. I have no illusions about who I am and what I'm like. You see, the road to hell is paved with this. When, when people start thinking, you know, I'm not all that bad. I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good person. I'm okay. I ain't killed anybody today. I ain't told any lies. You see, the problem with all of the religious leaders in Jesus' day is that none of them were sinners. Not all of them. It's like going to prison looking for a guilty man. Can't find him. We've gone. We don't need everybody here is innocent. I was framed. I was framed. I wasn't even there. If we had a spark of goodness in us, then God could have fanned that into a flame. Instead, he had to send his son to die for us because he worked it. It's not there. It doesn't have anything to work with. We've been damaged. We've, we've everything a part, everything that is a part of humanity. We're not, when you get right down to it, basically good folks. We're all sinners. He says, no one. No one is good. No one is good. Well, I'm pretty good. No, no, you're not. Remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus? He said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why callest thou me good? For there is none good but one, and that is God. Jesus said, there's only one good person, and that's God. Well, he thought he'd, cut a little, he'd get a little slack there by calling Jesus good. And you know what he thought about himself? Jesus said, have you kept the commandments? And he said, oh yeah, I kept them all. I kept them all since I was a child. So he called Jesus good master. And you know what he thought about himself? He thought he was good too. I've kept all the commandments of God. That was the problem with the religious people in Jesus' day. They, they, they thought they were good folks. And they didn't need a Savior. They were not sinners. They were offended by John the Baptist because he demanded that they repent. They didn't think they had anything to repent of. Verse 11 says, no one has ever really followed God's path or even truly wanted to. Now Paul is probably just kidding here. He doesn't really mean that. He doesn't really mean that no one, no one, not one has ever followed God's path or ever really wanted to. He doesn't mean that. He's exaggerating to get your attention. No, he's not. He's, he's not it like it is. That's right. And we don't want to hear that. We don't believe that. We don't, we don't, we don't hold to that. We don't think that's the truth. Everyone has turned away. We've all gone wrong. And no one anywhere has ever kept on doing what is right. And he says, let me, let me just put a, some punctuation right here and say, not one. Their talk is foul and filthy like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are loaded with lies. Everything they say has in it the sting of poison and dead and snakes. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They are quick to kill, hating one another, who dis anyone who disagrees with them. Well, I've never, in this life, I've never, in my whole life, I've never seen a time when people, if they, if you disagree with them, they don't just disagree with you back. They hate you. Mm -hmm. They hate you because you disagree with them. I'm thinking, well, man, how can we? 
How can we move on? How can we get to the truth? How can we, how can we make any progress? Is if you disagree with me, you can't just say, well, I disagree with you and this is why. You say, we're going we're to get a law passed that you can't come on our campus. And if you do, we'll set your car on fire. Okay. Besides, you're a racist. Anyway. I don't know, that just seems to fit everybody. Wherever they go, they leave misery and trouble behind them. I don't know where it started, how far to go back, and you can't blame one politician and one party. But there's not any element in Congress at all who's interested in solving problems or fixing things. They don't have a slightest bit of interest. They don't have one whit of interest to go to Congress and say, we're going to make things right. We're going to fix stuff. We're going to put it, we're going to make sure that everything fits. We're going to look at this problem. We're going to get together and we're going to, there's, we've got 465 representatives and 100 congressmen and 100 senators and not any of them, they're not there at all to solve problems and to make things better. That is not their intention one bit. He says, they're just, they don't care anything about what God or what he thinks of. Wherever they go, all they leave is misery and trouble behind them. Somebody might say, well, we got, we got babies being born in poverty and We've got unwed mothers. We have hunger and starvation. We've got terrible earthly, worldly conditions. What, what should we do? Somebody says, I know, we can kill all the babies. Somebody says, hey, now, there's an idea. That'll help a lot. They leave misery and trouble behind them. And they've never known what it is to feel secure or enjoy God's blessing. They care nothing about God and what he thinks of them. So the judgment of God lies very heavily upon the Jews. He said, you talking about, do they have any advantage? He said, well, some advantage because they have a lot of responsibility. For they are responsible to keep God's law instead of doing all of these evil things. Not one of them has any excuse. In fact, all the world sounds hushed and guilty before the Almighty God. Take verse 20 up there. Right down. Now, do you see it? No one can ever be made right in God's sight by doing what the law commands. If you obey all the commandments, he says, you're never going to be right in God's sight. For the more we know of God's laws, the clearer it becomes that we aren't obeying them. Jesus looked at the religious leaders in these days and said, you guys know the Bible better than anybody. And you think you've kept all the laws? He says, if you know the Bible better than anybody, you ought to know that you're sick and need a physician. The more we know of God's laws, the clearer it becomes that we aren't obeying them. His laws serve only to make us see we're sinners. Things haven't changed, have they? He says people are looking at, at the Word of God and they're saying, I'm a pretty good guy. He says, wait a minute. Are you reading the same Bible that I'm reading? Read it again. Because it says, you're not a pretty good guy at all. How can you look at the Word of God and say, I believe I'm going to be okay. You can't do that. It shows us that we're sinners. But now God has shown us a different way of heaven. Not by being good enough and trying to keep His laws, but by a new way. Though it's not new, really, for the Scriptures told about it long ago. Now God says that He will accept and acquit us, or declare us not guilty if we trust Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we all can be saved in the same way by coming to Christ, no matter who we are or what we've been like. Yes, we have all sinned and all fallen short of God's glorious ideal. Yet now God declares us not guilty of offending Him if we trust in Jesus Christ, who is His kindness, who in His kindness freely takes away our sins. For God sent Christ Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to end all of God's anger against us. He used Christ's blood and our faith as the means for saving us from His wrath. Remember, we learned in chapter 1 that when we're being saved, we're being saved from God's wrath. Not being saved from the devil. 
We're not being saved from our sin or by our sin's consequences. We're being saved from His wrath. In this way, He is being entirely fair. Even though He did not punish those who sinned in former times, for He was looking forward to the time when, when Christ would come and take away those sins. And now in these days also, He can receive sinners in the same way because Jesus took away their sins. But isn't this unfair for God to let criminals go free and to say they're innocent? No, for he does it on the basis of their trust in Jesus who took away their sins. But well, what then can we boast about? What can we brag about doing to earn our salvation? He says, we can't brag about anything. Oh, I did this. I joined the church. I was baptized. Uh, I raised my hand. I signed a card. I knelt at the altar. He said, no, you can't brag about it. You can't brag about that. Why? Because our acquittal is not based on our good deeds. It's based on what Christ has done and our faith in Him. So it is that we are saved by faith in Christ and not by the good things that we do. And does God save only the Jews in His ways? No. Gentiles too may come to Him in the same manner. God treats us all the same. All whether Jews or Gentiles are acquitted if they have faith. Well then, if we're saved by faith, does this mean that we no longer need to obey God's laws? He said, I know the way you people think. He says, oh, goody. Yeah, we can do whatever we want to do. He says, just the opposite. In fact, only when we trust Jesus can we truly obey Him. All right. Is that the last verse in, in chapter 3? Yeah. That's it. You see, when I became a Christian for the first time in my life, I had <coughs> the desire and the ability to be obedient and to trust God and to try to live as we say in Alabama, we live right. But uh, he says a lot of people, uh, I, I really don't find people so much who say that Jesus saved me so I can live any way I want to, but you will find that as a Baptist, you're accused of saying, people will tell people, that's what you believe because you're a Baptist. I don't believe that at all. That's what they were saying about Paul. I've heard people talk about easy believers. All you Baptists just believe, all you got to do is believe. Well, that's all you're going to do. But we become redeemed, saved, to change people when, he, when we express true faith in Christ. Well, folks, I hope you have a, a good week, and uh, we will not meet this Wednesday night, but next Wednesday night we will. Don't forget that Judge uh, Craig will be with us Sunday morning to be, be our getting of, of record. I'm looking forward to that. That will be a good service. And uh, I've asked uh, our, our two late preachers to to come and preach for us on February the 10th, morning and night. Uh, Lord willing, I'll be here, but still wanting to keep things before you that keep you on your heart's toes. All right? So anything that you have to say or anything before that I've overlooked today or we forgot to do or say, anything we've forgotten to tap on the nose today? Wash cloths and bar soap will be next month's item. Wash cloths and soap, all right? In February. <coughs> And I think Terry Moore is going to be leading Children's Church. Is that right? <coughs> All right. Okay, folks. God bless you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Be careful out there. And and go go buy 1.7 loaves of bread. We're we'll going tonight. <coughs>